en Hey everybody, welcome to Keeping It Spiritually Simple. And today I have an amazing guest. Her name is Shay Sparks. And her last name definitely is something that was divinely given to her because mm -hmm. she is a spark and a ray of light and inspiration to many when you hear some of her journey and why she does some of the things that she does now and how she really works on power investing in people, power investing in people to get you motivated, to get you going, to find your inner spark, call it your divine source, whatever you want. But I'm here to welcome Shay. Shay, how are we doing today? Oh, Sandra, thank you so much for having me on the show today. I'm excited. I'm fired up. You're <laughs> welcome. So my goodness, girl, you know, I could sit here and say you're an author and a co-founder of this and you do this, you do that. And you're a hair artist <laughs> and all <laughs> kinds of other things. And when you're a hair artist, which could be considered a cosmetologist, you're also a therapist. <laughs> you're everybody's yeah. friend in that chair. Uh, I kind of know this from aesthetics, massage, and just healing work. It just yes. brings in so many different tools that we use about ourselves. But sometimes it's just that creative, right brain, heart centered being that just fits that mold that does that J-O-B, not just to bring in income, but to help others find their own value within themselves by having a listening ear. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about your journey because, you know, we're getting to know each other and I'd love for the viewers to hear what brought you into today. Yeah, great question. So I am an overcomer of abuse, addiction, anger, depression, low self-worth, being a bully and being bullied. And uh, it wasn't until my mid thirties when I was getting out of an abusive relationship that I realized all of those things were happening. I didn't realize how angry I was or how depressed I was, how little self-worth I had. I didn't realize how much I had been a bully over my lifetime. Uh, or been bullied, like that never even crossed my mind either. And, you know, even to say the word abuse, like, wow, that that was so foreign, such a foreign concept to me. I never saw myself as a victim. So I kept going forward. So it never was like, oh, I should seek help, or I should remove myself from this situation. So what ended up um, was a very long journey, my healing journey was really a, a self-discovery of who I had become. I think we're born into this world, a, a being of light. And then our circumstances uh, dims us down because someone else other than ourselves is afraid that we're actually going to be the brilliant light that we are. And they want to squash us. So Life happens. People come into our lives and try to squelch that. Entities come into our lives and try to squelch that that light. And then uh, we emerge from this period of time where we're like, wait, hold on. Something's got to change. Something's got to shift. And then our journey begins. Our healing journey begins. And we peel away the layers of the onion that we are, that we all are. And each layer of piece of light starts to shine through and the more layers we peel through the more light shines through and so that's where really God works in us and then the point he works through us so mm -hmm. that's really where I am today is because of all of the work that he did within me so that I could be the beacon of hope to shine the light through well, that's beautiful. <clears throat> and first off, I'm sorry you had to experience those. But then again, we come in with these lessons that help shape and mold us yeah. to the stronger fulcrum of balancing the world, you know? So yeah. we have to take those those, um, those sad lumps and bumps, unfortunately, and at the hands of others who may not know any better or have their own baggage and they don't know how to treat themselves, much less treat another human being. So would you say that some of this journey started 
when you were a child with your oh, yeah. with your parents? Would you say with your siblings um, that that it started to occur that you could look back on? Oh, for sure. So I'm a full believer that our childhood experiences shape our adult decisions. And uh, one of the books that I read when I got out of my abusive relationship was a women who love too much. And it really should be called people who love too hard because it, it applies to men as well. And I found that the reason I was in the situation I was in, in that re abusive relationship was because it was familiar. So then that's when I really had to look back and I was like, oh my gosh, there's so much baggage, like you said, from childhood that I had was unresolved, but I hadn't even acknowledged because it's all we know, right? Like you just picked up that cup. So if all we know what's inside this cup, we have no idea what's around it. Um, you know, so living, growing up in the family that I grew up, I only knew what was in there. Mm -hmm. And so when I started to really go on this healing journey, I was like, wow, I had no idea that my, my parents were manipulative. I hadn't, and I had no idea that they were un emotionally unavailable. They didn't really know how to love uh, themselves each other, us as children, um, my siblings and I, my siblings were older than me, had two older brothers, and they didn't know how to be kind. They didn't know how to be around a girl. I mean, they had at a young age, they had pornography on their walls that I was exposed to. And that's where the low self-worth came into account. And, uh, well, that was just part of it, but all of the things that uh, I experienced and, you know, people say your innocence and your childhood is taken away. Really, like I said before, it was designed to teach me so many things so that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And then when the teacher is ready, the student appears. And, and had I not gone through what I went through, I, I believe that if other circumstances would have happened, there was a, a time in my life where I was, uh, I had dropped out of college. I was 18 and, um, I was lost. Like, I don't know where to go. What am I going to do next? And I was hanging out with some questionable friends doing some questionable things that, uh, may or may not have landed me in jail. If I had stayed in that, um, around that people around the, my friends, and I had an opportunity to go live with my dad. My parents were divorced at that time. And he lived in a bigger city, a, a state away. And I also had an opportunity to move in with my brother, my oldest brother and, and um, in Florida and work uh, where he worked, which was in the space industry. And I was like, he's trained in that. And I was like, well, what am I going to do? And he's like, well, you could work in the office. And I was like, gross. I don't want to sit in the office yeah. all day behind a desk. I mean, that's why I quit college because that's what I was going for, computer science, and that it was not appealing to me. And now, you know, 30 something years later, I am live in Florida and it's, oh, it is 30 years later. Gosh, crazy. Uh, funny, I think the reason I'm there now is because to help my brother heal. And he had been asking me for 28 years to move to Florida. And had I moved at any time before last year, I wouldn't have been able to one, heal him, but I wouldn't been able to show up for me where I was at 18, you know, whether I stayed in where I grew up or whether I moved to Florida, I think I would have been in a, a predicament where I would have been either a, a single mom, a in jail or dead or, you know, a complete alcoholic and drug addict. Mm -hmm. I was a teenage alcoholic and started drinking at 11, got a D was drinking every day at 15 and got a DUI at 16 and finally quit drinking at 23 and, or 24. And so it's, I just think about this often, like had I stayed, that's where I'd be. I'd be an addict and maybe dead. And then same thing with Florida, like had I gotten earlier, I wouldn't have, I would have picked the wrong crowd again, you know? So instead I went to Kansas city and my dad sat me down and he said, you have a week to decide what you're going to do. Either go back to school or find a school, find a job, or you have to go back to uh, Iowa where I grew up. And I was like, I don't want to go back there because I know it's nothing's there for me. 
and my two roommates that I had lived with before I moved, that they became single moms. Now that there's anything wrong with that, that's just not mm-hmm. the life that I wanted. Mm-hmm. It's just such a hard life um, to not, and I didn't have support from family to be able to do that. So I went to cosmetology school and I really believe that saved my life. It was uh, just being able to serve from a different place was very instilled in me very early. And I got very early in the the cosmetology program that I am here to make a positive impact on other people. Well, it sounds to me like you also had a, got a creative outlet through cosmetology because you do. There's, there's a lot involved. I mean, there's mm-hmm. color theory, there's, you know, angles of how to cut and so on and so forth. And I'm, I'm not a cosmetologist, but I've been in the, I've been in the chair enough times to just yeah. to, to appreciate, you know, a lot of the work that's being done on whatever hair they're given. <laughs> um, I used to have a hairdresser that used to say, oh, I can make masterpieces out of hair. And he was always bragging about, oh, you should have seen so-and-so that was in my chair. And one day I looked at him, I said, you do know that you're only as good as the head of hair you're working on, right? Mm. And it just yeah. blurted out of my mouth because that's just a side part of my personality. Right. And he looked at me and he's like, yeah. I said, because what might have looked good on her wouldn't have looked good on me mm-hmm. because my hair is completely different. So you really do have to become a creative artist right. when you're working on something because you've got to please that person as well as using your mastery in trying to design something that they want. But I want to go back to something that you said about childhood. And, you know, when you walk by your siblings walls and, you know, in my day, it was like fair faucet on the wall yeah. or it was not Cheryl Teagues or somebody, you know, my younger brother didn't have access to playboy or anything like that on the walls. But, you know, when you really think about it, because I was thinking about when you said that is, Everything that we see, sense, and feel is stored in our subconscious. Even if in the moment, it doesn't appear to be significant. And you can hear words from others, even if it's in a distance. It could be a radio in the background. It could be your mother on the phone, your parents fighting, an interaction at school, whatever it is. It's all being stored 24 seven in the subconscious, which is what then portrays to 95% of our actions and our behaviors. Even if we don't even know that it came from somewhere. So we get these feelings of, you know, all kinds of things because we're trying to self-develop and find our way. And we're going through hormonal changes ourselves. And if we don't have, mentors around us that really help to build us in that we're we're left to surfing to our own demise Mm -hmm. of trying to figure out where we fit in which is why we'll fit in with friends that maybe we don't necessarily see that they're derelict not going anywhere maybe didn't come from the same family structure that we Mm -hmm. have we don't look at all that in the judgment kind of way right we can look at it later and look back and go oh whoa Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. What was I doing? I didn't eat what? So it's really good that something, a pivotal something happened. First of all, you got it. I'm in school, supposed to be in school. Can't go anywhere without my school, right? Got to be in college. Got to have that degree because that's ingrained in there. Mm -hmm. So this isn't for me. I don't know how to change my major. I need to get the hell out of Dodge. But then where do I go? Where do I belong? I don't belong anywhere. Yeah. And then you wind up in front of your father who comes down pretty harsh. Yeah. You got seven days, sister, seven days to figure it out. And then you really had to go down memory lane on speed dial. Yes. Wouldn't you say? Yes. And that was pivoting for turning your life around and going into cosmetology but then it led you down to some other amazing certifications that you do now that help others and empower others but you're still 
doing some of the hair artistry, which I think is freaking awesome. Because sometimes you just you just get that person that's been around you so long in your chair and it's you're just bonded. Yeah. 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 A lot of my clients I've had for 25 years. And uh, so right now I'm, I'm traveling. I went on a tour and so I'm in Kansas city. And um, of course I had, uh, I had a, a former business partner that we would share clients and she was like, well, so-and-so is always saying, if you ever come in town to let her know. So I thought, well, if I put it out for one, I have to put it out for whoever wants it. So I took to social media and said, Hey, I'm in town. Who wants to grab coffee or, you know, hair client or coaching. And so I, yeah, got booked up uh, for what I was going to do. I only allowed myself one day a week. I wasn't going to get a uh, burnout again. Cause that's what I found that I was doing for many, many, many years. Um, but the funny thing is, is that, I mean, yeah, I've grown up where I did their wedding. They had a baby. Now that baby's graduated and having a baby of their own, gotten married, you know, it's like the generations that I've been through yeah. as a hairstylist. But I want to talk, if you don't mind, I want to mention something about the un the unconscious, what you're talking about. Please. In the beginning. So I'm a master practitioner of NLP, hypnosis and uh, MER. And one of the things that we learn is that we get 2 million bits of information every single second. And it all goes to our unconscious. However, there's only 126 bits of that information out of 2 million stay in our, in our uh, conscious mind. So a lot of times things we are triggered and we don't even know is a trigger because it's been stored, like you said, in the uh, subconscious or unconscious mind. So when my dad said, you know, you got it seven days, I really had to, yeah, get back into my unconscious and be like, okay, well, what would be fun and what would I enjoy doing? And I thought, you know, I did hair and makeup from all my friends' dances growing up from, you know, middle school on. Why not try that and see what happens? If anything, I can do it for, you know, a few years and then decide to go back to college and do something else. And so it was really a catalyst for me to, um, to be a fantastic um, career and support me and then being able to figure out what's next. And yeah, all the other things just kind of came into play. Came into play, but you know, if you want to touch base on, on the NLP and you want to touch base on, on hypnosis, I'm certified in a few of them. And I did so because it has such a profound effect on my own growth and my own inner getting to know me. And so I also did it to broaden some of the toolboxes that I have to share. But, you know, when I think about one person on a table that I only have the ability to one set of money, one person per hour, how many hours a day do I have, et cetera. But I also look at it that that one person that I've worked with echoes out to their family, yeah. into their network, into their network. So until spirit guides me to create some other things, I'm okay with the one-on-one -on -one at this time. Um, but I know you're doing a little bit of, of all of that. You're doing individual clients and then you're doing your tour. So you're, you're hitting multitudes of people. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So, um, gosh, where do I start with that? So a couple of years ago, my brother and I had been, um, uh, we had gone through a, season of loss. So in 2020, May of Memorial Day of 2020, we lost our brother. And then um, two years before that, we lost our dad. And then two years before that, lost our mom. And so everyone in the Midwest was now gone and I was still here. And so my brother is like, why don't you move to Florida, of course. And because uh, he doesn't give up. <laughs> Thank God he didn't. Um, <clears throat> so I thought, well, I don't know, let me try it on. So the next year I drove, I went on my first tour. And I drove down to Florida and I stopped, uh, it took about five days and I stopped and saw a former hair clients, former coaching or coaching clients. I saw people who had been on my podcast, people who, um, I have a co-author book called Firestarters Book Project. So people who had been in the book or, you know, wanted to know more about the book. So I just set up all these appointments along the way and, and, um, 
decided to take a month off from the salon and, and got in my car and did it and did this cross country tour. And it was just the love that you feel when you meet someone in person that you've known online is uh, just an, an appreciation for not only for who you are, I mean, not only for who they am, but also appreciation for that, you know, God led you to that person in the first place. And there's this, this gratitude of, wow, I'm so lucky to be connected to this. So blessed to be connected to this, this person. Um, so when I started doing that, I did it for uh, a month and then drove back and stopped again at places. And, and it was just such a freeing moment as, and this was coming out of the pandemic. So to be able to feel like, oh, I am free. I can just get in my car and go really opened me up for, okay. So there are so many things that we have access to that sometimes we forget because we're in our own little five mile radius of the world. Right. And so, uh, I had written my first book, gosh, seven years ago. And I didn't know what I was modeling, but what had happened is several people had read it and they said, you know, it's very similar to NLP. You should really look into it. And I was like, nah, NLP it's associated with someone I'm not really a fan of. I won't name any names, but I'm like, nah, I'm good. And, um, as time went on, you know, I kept getting you know, signals or signs or whatever hints that I should probably look into that. And so, you know, I thought after my coaching certification that I would be quote unquote done. And I know someone, God has other plans for us at times. So then I meet another person uh, just last year who said, you know, your book is like NLP. You should really look into it. And I told him, I said, well, thank you. And I just am not a fan of this other person. And he said, oh, this is the guy who trained him. And uh, I said, oh, okay, I got it. Mm -hmm. And so it'll be different. And I went, okay. So I went forward with it and continued in the training after the first training session, went on to the master practitioner training. And, and again, just to learn more about the unconscious. Um, it, it's amazing to me that when you are in a one-on-one -on -one situation, you sometimes can feel the energy shift in someone and all of a sudden they were having a bad day and now they're having a, a great day by the time they leave your presence. And then to really be in a group of people and to have like a group coaching and to see the entire room shift in their their continents, their light shift, the ahas, their, the bounce in their step shift. It's like, this is where it's at. It's, it's the one-on-ones are great, but the one to many mm -hmm. was really, I feel like what I went through was really where God was calling me. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I also think it, 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 it transforms limited beliefs Yes. Within self and within your opinions of um, the world around you. Yes. Because really, we don't even realize again that we the surveillance camera has stored all this stuff up here right. and it has shape shifted our opinions right. on certain things. And then we, we think we own it as our own, but we really haven't dissected enough up there to find out what really is ours and what has been the programming of all those who have come into our see, sense and feel locations, all of our lives, including background music, television, you know, et cetera. Yeah. It all influences one way or the other, but you know, I'm kind of in awe of the fact that you're like, okay, we're going to put one month of my schedule on hold and, and I'm just going to tend into it down to Florida. And I'm going to, I'm going to stop here stop there and stop here. And then on the way back, I'm going to stop here. And stop. That <laughs> is so inspirational, no, especially thanks. after, you know, 
the whole worldwide got to stay yeah. in your house. Don't right. don't think about 10 and 2 unless you're masked up. And I'm still right. seeing how that's affecting people psychologically to oh, this sure. day here in the D.C. Yeah. area. I still see it, how people have just changed a lot and yeah. still live behind the mask. And, you know, oh. I just have to be neutral and just be love through it because mm -hmm. I don't know all the reasons and I don't need to know them. I don't need to yeah. know them. I need to stay in my lane. But when people come across my plate, I want to kind of hear their stories because I like to I like to just listen because I'm just in all of um, the independence that some people have to just mm. step out of their comfort zone and and just head in that direction. And, you know, the energies right now are really into that. Mm -hmm. And it's also um, supporting. But. The energies don't change until we begin to start some kind of wave somewhere in some sector. Yes. And so, you know, you were one of those in that early wave of, okay, let's break out of this and let's do it hard and let's do it fast. And then let's visit. And then it wound up that you were getting more education on neuro-linguistic programming, yeah. NLP which is amazing because I've learned it is just using different words and different perceptions of it. But I took some, some courses in it with my hypnosis, but I didn't feel like I needed to dive any deeper as some people did. Um, I guess mostly because I work from a feeling based mm -hmm. who knows what could happen down the, down the road, but it's such a great listening and responsive tool to help people. Wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Absolutely. It really helps you craft, I would say, um, a response rather than coming from a place of reaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it all goes to the, what, what do we learn about listening? You know, are you listening to learn and understand or are you listening to reply? Right. And, you know, growing up, you know, I had five siblings. Mm -hmm. So when my mother asked something, you better have your answer ready. Right. So mm -hmm. I necessarily wouldn't hear what my siblings might be saying. I was so busy. So I really wasn't always listening. Well, that's something mm -hmm. I had to learn as I got older, just like patience. <laughs> if they sold patients in a department store, the shelves would be empty and I would become a patient's hoarder. I would <laughs> hoard the stuff. I'm telling you. And I would dole it out only to special people. Mm -hmm. would be my liquid gold to life would be that <laughs> patience but it's amazing all the things that we learn as we get older mm -hmm. and when we're with somebody who has those skills that is listening first off and setting their energy to the tone of i am just focused on you and the words mm -hmm. that you're using and spirit is moving me i use the word spirit god you use the word more god it's all the same essence right yeah. and then you're responding in ways that is more receptive to the person who's sharing something with you. So mm -hmm. I would call that again, a super tool that you're using. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You know, the um, process of being, as you know, in the, in the industry, the beauty industry, you really have to learn what people aren't saying right? Because they're going to say a whole lot. And then you're like, okay, what is it that they're really not saying? So they're saying, and then you have to have the capability to ask the right questions to get to where, what, how, and what service you're going to perform. And it's every person has this different way of communicating. And it's over the years, I always found it really profound how some people would tell me, this is what I want, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, okay, they're telling me one thing, but I know they really mean another. So instinctively, I would know that. So I would just continue to ask questions. And then it was like, yeah, I didn't think that you really wanted that. <laughs> um, so I think that really gave me such a an amazing foundation to one, become a coach, but two, to be the the, the podcast, start the podcast and and do all the other the other shows that I do because, you know, being present is a, a, like you called it a super tool is we we're not taught to be present and in the moment and really focusing on what the other person has to say from a place of, like you said, from understanding, mm 
-hmm. And we, most of the time we're caught up in our head and we're focused on not even how to reply. We're focused on, oh, what is, what is the to-do list? You know, how much time is this going to take? Wish they'd get to the point, you know, all the things that just naturally come in that we don't even realize we're thinking. So during my, my healing journey, that was one of the many things that I was super beneficial to me was capturing my thoughts and writing them down in a journal. And I call it a brain dump and just getting it all out to really recognize some of the the things that I was saying to myself, that's limiting beliefs that you mentioned that were really hurting me. Well, that's a, that's your road of self-discovery, which makes you even a better mentor and coach, teacher, instructor. Mm-hmm. I, I, there's a big difference between, to me, a teacher and an instructor. An instructor is getting in there and giving your hands-on tools on how to do things. A teacher is just kind of telling you more or less, you know, I mean, I have a big difference between I was a, a aesthetics instructor. Mm-hmm. And so I, I taught for several years, people trying to become an, a, an esthetician. Yeah. And so I could write all the lecture notes I wanted. But unless I brought it into my own experiences in the offices or places that I worked or the room during it. And then also I found when we had the the um, hands on work mm-hmm. that I literally would instinctively come around somebody and put my hands on their hands and move them in different movements so that then they could feel and see how that was because most of the people that were in set in static school were kinesthetic tactile Mm -hmm. learners um and again learning more and more about myself throughout the time so you probably have a lot of awesome tools you know in your instructor belt well, it's so funny I, how we are, how we connected and how much we're in alignment is just so funny to me. Uh, I also we taught are. in ontology school and then I went on to work for a salon for 10 years and I was the, uh, the title as educational director. So I literally just taught haircutting for 10 years and, and then continued after I left there and went on to my own business, continued to train. And it was all hands-on, right? And then I did the exact same thing. I'm like grabbing their hand, holding the the comb or the scissors or, you know, however, a certain way and or positioning their posture. So they're standing in a way that they're not going to be like all hunched over um, at some point. And so to be able to tap into that, uh, like you said, the kinesthetic learning, I hadn't really even thought about it until you said it that day that I had you on uh, real talk. And I was like, wow, that's so crazy. How often, especially children, as children, we don't think about the touch and how mm. to learn things. Right. And, you know, getting your hands in dirt is so important because you're feeling the dirt, you're feeling the grit, you know, and um, you know, the sand, whatever it is, touching it, the slime, all of those things that we have, Play-Doh, things that we have with kids is really teaching us that touch uh, learning. So I love yes. that you had mentioned it before. Yes. And I think it gets bypassed a lot because we're getting kids out of their play and more into their scholastic side. Yeah. Of it. They need to know this by the time they're in kindergarten. You're like, right. what, what? And now that I'm older, my kids are grown. I see grandkids. I'm like, no, no. We're going to go cut up dolls and play and, you know, we're going to measure. I'm going to show you how to measure to make cookies. We're not going to cut it off of a stick. You know, we're going to, we're going to measure how to do that. And we're, we're bypassing a lot of that. And that also brings me to the topic that, you know, a lot of these new kids that are coming in with different energetic skills already kind of know the answer. So they're missing that show your work kind of thing. They just Mm. know the answer and then they're bored with what do you mean? I got to show my work, but there's something to be said for going through each step Mm -hmm. because it's all a step of exploration and self self self-exploring. And it's an adventure. If you choose it to be even the frustrating parts, right? You know, look how long it takes a baby to hold a, hold a spoon to get a spoon or get a Cheerio between their fingers. Look how long it takes kids to, to properly hold a pencil and, and get it where it's steady. I mean, we're brain developing mm-hmm. and we're bypassing a lot of that with just the computer yep. typing yep. and things like that. So I think some of the things that you're teaching is really 
about how to get back into that dance with yourself, mm -hmm. how to get the curves and the yes. movement, no matter what your physical body is or how restrained you have felt your life has kept you or how crazy your life has been. And maybe you need to, to bring it in a little bit and work on those boundaries, self-develop that, and then come out because there you're going to find the nooks and crannies of treasures about you. Mm. I love that. As you were talking, it, you know, it, it made me think about, well, one, when I was teaching haircutting, we would have them repeat the haircut, you know, five to 15 to 25 times. And so until it's quote unquote, perfect. And, um, you know, they would get so frustrated and mad at me and like, oh my God, I can't believe you're having me do this again. You had one little tiny thing to cut. You're such a drill sergeant. And I'm like, yeah, but your repetitive motion is what's teaching you. And you're learning so much about yourself in the process, you know, being able to learn differently from a place of uh, being open to feedback, right? And uh, that that's really what it, it's about. And and one of the things I love to do with my clients, something I learned in improv class actually, is getting into a character walk. So you walk around the room and any, it doesn't have to be a circle, but you just walk aimlessly around the room and then you try on different emotions. Like, what does it feel? What, it, how do you walk? How does your posture when you're depressed, how you're sad, how you're happy, how you're excited? Like, what, is, what does your face look like? You know, how is your stature? Are you walking faster? Are you walking, you know, with your shoulders back? And that's where the, the kinesthetic comes into play is because then you can moving your body. Like you said, the dance, you're really learning about yourself. And then you get to notice, oh, I'm sitting with my shoulder slouched. Am I, am I upset? Like what's going on? And then you're able to correct that mm -hmm. rather than come from a place of, oh, this is how I am. And I'm going to accept how I am. No, it's really that self-discovery piece. That is powerful. And you, you figure that's what, you know, actors go through, you know, everybody thinks they just get up on the screen and they just go, no, most actors are very, very introverted and they yeah. really have to go into all the movements. And it's, it's, it's a repetitive mechanical psychological thing that they have to go through. Um, and then anytime we're getting into learning about self, the first thing we do is how are you sitting right now? What's the yeah. tone of your voice? What does your, resting bitch face actually say is yes. it really because sometimes people will look at me and my own daughter just said it recently like mom and I went what and she goes your expression said it all and I went well I don't have a thought in my head so how does my expression <laughs> <laughs> so then I had to bring it back to oh I need to pay attention to the muscles on my face and what they're saying because mm -hmm. somebody could totally misconstrue what it is I was, I was thinking at the time. So that's an excellent exercise. And I think a lot of people ought to think about maybe how are you walking up and down the stairs? How, how do you present when you walk up to a coworker? And then how do you present when you walk up in front of a boss? Where's right. your vocal tones? Where's your physical body? Just pay mm -hmm. attention. I read that on a lot of people because mm -hmm. I, you know, I've learned to read energy as a child and so I would, I can read a lot of that on people, um, but it, it's just interesting to learn it from a, uh, a classroom perspective. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, right. but it's when you were talking way. about the haircutting thing, I go, oh, it's, I'm sorry, you talk about the haircutting thing, you know, I make them do it 10 or 12 times. Per I'm like, oh dear God, what did they look like by it either in the beginning or at the end? Cause you're like, I already did this angle. And then they're like, Ch -ch -ch. Oh no, they had to have 12 or uh, 15 models. So it wasn't the same person cutting again. Mm. It was, you know, all these different models. And and then they had to go find the models, which was also teaching them how to network and build up oh, their clientele. Yes. Because a lot of times those clients, those models that they had became their clients. Again, things they never even thought they were really like learning, but it's like the... Um, karate kid right wax on wax off and you're learning the the karate moves it's the same thing yeah so tell us a little bit about your book and you're on tour right now right yes so um, my first book is called how to get your voice back and it's um around kind of what I had talked about earlier about the brain dump so it is a journal prompt book 
So there, it kind of gives you a little background story about me, but really about re kind of six steps to rebuild your confidence when negativity takes you down. So it's really noticing, capturing your thoughts and noticing what it is that you're thinking and saying about yourself. And then really being able to identify those that you, that find inspirational and what is it, the characteristics that they have, and then doing something profound, which is then saying, I am in front of those Mm -hmm. because we Mm -hmm. are a mirror a real reflection of what we see. And we don't even notice those amazing things about ourselves because we're so stuck on the, the brain, the, the negative, right? So that's my first book. And then um, I'm a co-founder of Firestarters Book Project, which is a compilation co-author book where people from all walks of life come together, kind of like chicken soup for the soul. But we talk about a very specific thing. So a specific theme. So rather than like chicken soup for the soul had like for military wives and for teachers and stuff like that. We talk about a theme. So the first uh, one we came out with was how to be a spark of hope in the midst of change. And we had two chief master sergeants from the air force and a Navy submarine veteran and life coaches and marketing coaches and podcasters were in the book. And then the next book that we're have, we're coming out with that we are accepting new co-authors for um, is called rekindle your kindness what the world needs now and it is um gosh we have life coaches we have podcasters we have trauma coaches and it's just really about the kindness that you know we've lacked to see in the world but really just rekindling it because i believe like i said in the beginning we're all born with this light and we're born with the kindness we're born to be kind it's just how we access it as we get older and how we choose to access it. Mm-hmm. And again, going back to childhood, sometimes you can be kind and then you'll be shamed for it. Yes. And then you have this thing that comes along with, you know, that is, that's associated with being weak or willy nilly or whatever. You know, when you're talking about, um, you know, going out in the world and finding what it is you're supposed to work on. There were times when I would say, uh, Okay. All right, spirit. What's, what's my lesson today? What are some of the things you'd like for me to work on? And I'll literally go out and within the first 10 minutes, I'll run into somebody who's snippy or bitchy or snarling. (laughs) And then I'll literally go, great. That's my subject today. (laughs) I got to work on improving my (laughs) snarl, you know, (laughs) you know, thanks Thanks for that. Okay. Yeah. It's like, all right, fine. I really thought I was done with all that, but obviously not, Mm -hmm. but just to kind of make it fun because I, you know, like you, I just, I want to experience life and I want to experience the experiences so deep and so passionate. I don't care how badly it hurts. I want to go into that hurt. I want to, I want to go into the joy. I want to go into the, I'm so confused, you know, whatever the emotion and the thought and what's associated with it. And then all those things Now I'm kind of a rare breed. You know, I, I like to open the window up and just jump the hell out, but I've learned that not everybody's like that. They almost shy away from, I don't really want everyone to see my real me. So that's Mm. why we have so many facades going on out there and what we present when we first meet somebody, somebody may not be who we present three or four meetings down the road, which is why first dates are generally a joke, right? Because sure. you're always coming with your A game. That's why I can't do dating sites or any of that kind of craziness. Because I'm like, you either meet me and we work on that. Or no, you're not going to read a profile and decide, yes, that's worth swiping or blocking and deleting. So I'm like, you either meet this or you go away. But we're learning so much about being more open these days because yes. we have YouTube. We have more Zooms going on. We have more people saying, you know what? I'm going to take this from my experience and I'm going to turn it in to a mission for my job. And I like that mission for my job, not just to help people, but to sustain me as well. So you got a lot of people coming away from what maybe they used to do to putting out their shingle and going through the ups and downs of feeling all of that. Now, how did you start your podcast? And then how did you like, say, besides, you know, 
going driving to Florida and stopping at all these places, leaving your shingle, and then coming back and touching your shingle again, going, hey, I'm back. It's three times a charm. I'm sure you did it again. How did you start all of that? And then what did what would you say to someone that's listening in the audience? Like, hey, I've had some experiences and I'd really like to know a little bit more about me and how I can share that. Great question. So what I think I, well, I, what I'm going to answer first, I think is the, uh, how I started my podcast. So, um, I had heard about podcasting from a guy I dated once. So talk about dating. That's like a whole nother show. We could talk for hours on dating, we'll but, <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll get to that another day. Yes. But, um, so I dated this guy who had a podcast and I thought it was really fascinating the concept of podcasting, what he did with it, I thought was really whatever it is, what it is. I didn't really, well, it wasn't my thing. He just sat around and his buddies and him talked about movies, whatever. That's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to make an impact. So when he was telling me about it, I was like, huh, I really like that. And so the local community college actually had a class on how to start a podcast. So I went and learned some things and I'm like, okay, well, this is definitely doable. And then I pray about it. I'm like, okay, God, what do you want me to talk about? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to call it? Blah, 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 blah. And uh, years before I had attended an entrepreneur um, conference from um, one of the sharks from Shark Tank and uh, how to pitch your business to investors. That's what the Entrepreneur um, Academy, I think they called it, was about. And I learned very quickly that it's not like what it is on TV. They don't show the backstory. They don't really care what your backstory is. They just want to know the numbers. And then when that was like dropped, right? The, the shoe dropped. Um, and then to go forward, you had to put down like $20,000 or $40,000 or whatever they were asking. Ungodly number. All of the faces in the room was like. Oh. And so I'm looking at all these entrepreneurs and I am had talked to many of them on break of what their business was, what their product was. And I'm thinking to myself, like these people, not and me, we're all very passionate about what we do. And it's our baby. Our business becomes our baby, right? And so you're wanting us to pitch it so that then at some point we sell it off. So wonder if there was someone who come along and invested in the person, not the product. The product can be shifted or changed or whatever, but really invest in the person and then just come beside them and continue on along the way. What if you were investing in the person? So then I was like, well, what would I call this podcast? And I remembered that whole thought process of that entrepreneur academy. And I went, oh, well, the power of investing in people. That's what it's going to be called. And then I was like, well, what am I going to, who am I going to talk to? And I was like, you know, I have all these entrepreneur friends who have gone through a horrific circumstances that no one talks about. So they just portray online how amazing they're doing. And that's great. But there's all this back end stuff that no one knows. So let's talk about that, um, the muck and the yuck, and then how that really propelled them into the success that they had, because they learned some lesson along the way. And as I started to do that, I literally started uh, on speakerphone in my closet recording on my laptop. <laughs> it was very ugly. And that's really uh, funny. One of the podcasting conferences that I attend, the the, own, the founder of that wrote a book called Starting Ugly on how to start a podcast, Start Ugly. And uh, when I read that, I was like, oh, that's so what I did. And it wasn't really about getting it right or getting it perfect. It was about the story. It was about the sediment to the intention behind the story and allowing, a, a creating a safe space for the conversation. And I thought, I'll figure it out as I go along. And so I did a season, I did 24 episodes and I was going to school to, for my coaching, I was working in the salon and I owned the salon at the, at the same time and grieving my father. And it was a lot and I got burned out. And so I was doing it weekly. And then all of a sudden I was like, you know what, 24 episodes in, I need a break. So then I decided, okay, I'm calling it a season. And so then I went to a podcast conference and um, walking around and I meet 500 people. <laughs> and on the last day, this gentleman said to me, well, tell me about your coaching. What do you do? And I said, I transform trauma into treasure. And he's like, oh, have you considered working with veterans? 
I said, well, that's funny. I meet them everywhere I go. And so he's like, well, I think you should consider it. And, um, let me get you connected. And he is just such a, uh, he was a gift, uh, that day in my life. He still is. He's a good friend of mine. Um, but he introduced me to military creator con, which is uh, part of another podcast conference, uh, the following year. And I went and I met uh, amazing people and I was looking for an editor cause I couldn't do the work anymore. I didn't want to do the work by myself anymore. And so I now have a team of people behind me that are all veterans and, you know, I, I may work with a lot of veterans coaching them and interviewing them. And so it evolved not to just entrepreneurs, it really involved to business and military leaders on investing, not just in people, but investing in leadership, investing in relationships, investing in self-love. And what does that look like? And so as this has evolved, it's now year five, season 10 is coming out in the beginning of November. And I have 200 and I don't know, 215, 220 episodes. And to just see how it's evolved. And now I have, I'm doing videos where I started with just audio and, and I, I recommend that anyone who started just don't worry about the details unless that's something that you want to get stuck in. Cause that's where I was for a while. But if you just want to start, start. Um, there's so many apps now I, that that weren't around when I was uh, doing it, like Anchor, which is now I think Spot Spotify for podcasters. You literally record on your phone. You record, they record on their phone, and it, it's an audio. And um, you know you can set up your phone to record video if they want to do that. But the intent has stayed the same for me of the podcast. So if anyone is thinking about starting a podcast, I always ask, you know what what's the motivation behind it. What do you what do you want to gain out of having a podcast? And for me, it was really about the one to many instead of the coaching one to one. It was the one to many of really bringing to light that if we can all overcome these obstacles and we have learned these lessons, then I know that it ignites a tiny spark of hope and connection and community and love in other people. And then as that whole community lights up, then the whole world starts to light up. Mm. Whoo, breathe on that one. That's very <laughs> powerful. It's very powerful. But the light started with you. The light yeah. started with Shay Sparks seeing who she is mm -hmm. and the light within her and then wanting to, to share that light and then the whole room, the whole dark room gets lit up when everybody's holding a flashlight, you know, not just one, one flashlight, the whole, the whole room is holding an individual flashlight because they're seeing the power within themselves and then setting the intention just by listening to your story. Right. It's, an, it's very inspiring. My mind is like going in so many places, but I know we're coming up on the hour and um, I know we're going to have to do two, number two, part two, because <laughs> uh, there's always a number two, is there to be able. Um, but then, you know, I've got your, um, your linked, your link tree. Yes. With all your stuff in it. But let's just tell the viewers where they could find you, um, even though it'll be in the description when I post out. Okay. So my pa, my my website is called shaysparks.com mm -hmm. and uh, you can find um, the books on there, the podcast and social media. And you can always send me a message on social media. I love to connect uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram is the Shay Sparks, the Shay Sparks. And my podcast is now called the power of investing in people. And in a couple of weeks, it will be called the Shay Sparks show. And you can also find me on UNN, unitednetwork.tv, where uh, Real Talk is, where Sandra was a guest. So you feel free to check her out. And you can also find uh, Real Talk on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google, all of the podcast players. And I also am a co-host of a show called Underwired. And it is all on um, Spotify and all of the, all the platform, all the podcast platforms. 
And then I am also a co-founder of Firestarters Book Project that I mentioned, and you can find out more information or if you're like, all right, I already know I'm in and you want to book an appointment with us to to just, you know, talk about what your chapter would be about, it is firestartersbookproject.com. Hmm. Well, you know, I just want to reach through Zoom and like touch, get a spark of you because it's like you, you've done so much to mold yourself that it's like if somebody could even just get in a couple of those layers of their desires, bring them into fruition and to start reaching out and and helping others self-develop and empower through investing in people that you had to invest in yourself first. Yes. And go through the cycling of that because that in tune has you become more present when you're around other people. And I think it also fine tunes multiple antennas of reading information when you're around people too. That's also a super tool. So my hat is off to you. you. My heart wishes we could just hang out here longer, but again, we're going to have to do number two. So we're going to end this recording and thank everybody for joining us. Please look at the links descriptions below and uh, reach out to Shay. And if you have any other questions, you're welcome to reach out to me. But in the meantime, please show your support by liking, subscribing, sharing, and all your comments are appreciated. All right. Say goodbye, Shay, and then stay put. So we'll talk. Yep, say goodbye. bye. Good.